respond to the proceedings, and secondly, because of the Supreme Court's uh, decision. So we believe, uh, surprise, surprise, that there needs to be serious legislative amendment. We've listed a number of recommendations there. We think the Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears should be a ministerial regulation expressly admissible in legal proceedings. We've been on the record saying that for many years at this point, back to 2010. We believe a mortgage rescheduling tribunal should be set up to deal with appeals from decisions uh, under the MARP and should have the statutory power to impose solutions where necessary, including debt write-down. The one thing that isn't happening is people remaining in their homes with a debt write-down where the amount owed is reduced to something resembling the current market value of the property, which is provided for under the Personal Insolvency Act 2012. Um, borrowers must be entitled to a full range of services, both financial advice and legal advice, to make out their case. The hearings need to take place in private. For those whose mortgages are manifestly unsustainable, access to an expanded and beefed-up mortgage-to-rent scheme seems to be absolutely essential uh, at this point. And really, the state needs to take responsibility and leadership here in terms of promoting access to these services uh, as a way to finally solve a, a personal debt crisis that has been going on now functionally for about a decade. Um, we also believe uh, there's a number of social welfare reforms that are required. We think mortgage interest supplement might be usefully reintroduced uh, in, in cases of short-term arrears. There are cases still going into arrears for the first time. Um, there's been a lot of discussion of the rent supplement and the HAP caps, again, as a temporary measure, and I think it's agreed that, that those payments need to be increased. It's not a long-term solution, but it, it will certainly help in the short term. We believe that the social welfare payments for the under 26s um, cause a serious danger of incipient, uh, incipient homelessness. Um, there's, I think, some 600, uh, according to Focus Ireland, uh, people under the age of 26 now uh, homeless. We support uh, a, right, a legal right to housing, whether in the Constitution or through legislation, or belt and braces through both. Um, and finally, uh, FLAC has always been an organisation that focuses on improved civil legal aid services and has always campaigned for improved civil legal aid. And, and the, the, the failure, for example, to have legal aid available for local authority tenants uh, faced with eviction really is something that needs to be uh, um, immediately redressed. Just as a final observation, it's obviously very welcome this committee has been uh, formed. We're uh, a little bit uh, uncertain as to why it's only on a temporary basis, given that we have have a, a, a senior minister with responsibility for housing being appointed. We think it would be a good idea if this committee existed on a semi-permanent or permanent basis to monitor um, the plan that's to be put in place. Uh, thanks for your intention indeed. Mr Joyce, I, I suppose just to clarify the last point, this committee was set up in advance of a government or any ministers or whatever and given a role to the 17th of June. In the ordinary run of events, other eruptus committees will be established, and that will be a matter to be dealt with. But we were set up before the minister with a job of work to do, so I'm not preempting what might happen afterwards. But this is for this point in time. Um, a number of members have questions. Uh, Deputy Quinlevin. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just want to thank you for firstly mentioning that you, you believe the cause of the crisis is the privatisation of, you know, the reliance on the privatisation. I think it's really important that we do stress that each time. I think everybody, practically everybody on the committee would agree with that. The previous government's plan, the 2020 plan, is to deliver 80% of the housing under the in the private sector, and that's not going to happen. It's not, it's, not going to, it's not going to solve the problem that we have. So I welcome the fact that you actually said that in your first statement there. Just briefly, on your list of recommendations, number seven, it's the basis of the mortgage insurance scheme, and I think that's, and they, they, this term you use there as well, the state needs to take leadership, and I think that's what must come out of this committee in the final report as well, has to be made simplified for people, has to be, and how, how would you suggest we, we simplify that? And just a third very quick question is, to access your services, how long is your waiting list, or do you have a waiting list, or how do people apply to your services? 
Okay. Well, ju just to take the last question first, uh, free legal advice centres often confused with uh, the Legal Aid Board, the State Civil Legal Aid Services. So we're actually uh, a voluntary organisation. Um, we do, though, have legal advice centres all over Ireland, um, and they are uh, staffed by volunteer lawyers uh, who are in private practice who give of their time to, to give basic legal advice generally in evening uh, time clinics. So there's generally speaking no waiting list. Some, some centres are by appointment only. Um, sometimes you might not get to a centre on the particular evening because there's a, a, a queue, but generally speaking it's, it's, it's fairly quick access. But it is for advice only. It's not a legal aid. Uh, service. Um, your other question was on the mortgage to rent um, scheme and how it can be I improved. Uh, again, we wouldn't be intimately familiar with the scheme, and um, you know the likes of Cluid Housing, for example, seems to us to have been the, the housing association with the most experience, and that has processed the most cases under the mortgage to rent scheme. Um, but there, there was an announcement, I think, from uh, the government last May, and uh, Minister. Kelly suggested the mortgage rent to rent scheme was to be expanded, but we didn't see uh, any, haven't seen any developments um, since. Um, the, a number of the accounts in arrears over two years are, are probably financially uh, unsustainable by any yardstick, um, and therefore mortgage to rent seems to be, um, you know, a necessary step at that point. Things like the valuation of the properties, the earnings of the individual. One problem which I don't think has been mentioned um, to any great extent is the fact that quite a number of, of those properties may have judgment mortgages registered against the property by an unsecured creditor who's obtained a court judgment. Um, and that may constitute a barrier in terms of the housing association being able to buy the property with a, a judgment on the title. We think um, that needs to be looked at. The issue of, of finance been invested by, by the state uh, in the scheme. Also an important uh, issue to address. I think mortgage to rent isn't available if the property is in positive equity. Should that necessarily be the case if the, the borrower is in such uh, clear arrears and in such financial difficulty? Um, so there's a, I think Cluid did a review in 2013 where they proposed a very uh, long list of potential improvements uh, to the scheme. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Anyone else? Deputy Function? Yeah, just in relation to your, your recommendations, you have a mortgage reschedule tribunal, which is sort of like, I suppose, what you would see as an appeals mechanism. Can you just give us some more information on that? Because I think that's a very, it would be a very good idea. I agree with the point you made in relation to not having an appeal. I mean, I used to work for a trade union, and that was one of the fundamental things we would always argue for, that everyone has a right to an independent appeal, the fact that we don't do that for people in mortgage distress. So I think that could be something that possibly the committee could explore more if we could just get some more detail on it. Okay, well, currently, under the Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears, there, there is an appeal from the Lenders Arrear Support Unit, which is the, the unit that assesses the financial information, the standard financial statement, looks at a potential range of so-called alternative repayment arrangements and decides to grant one or not to grant one at its own discretion. Um, there's an appeal then from the Lenders Arrear Support Unit to the Lenders Appeals Board. Now, in our experience, uh, a lot of those appeals are rubber stamping exercises where the Appeals Board upholds the decision of the Arrear Support Unit often with very little detail as to how they arrived at their conclusions. So in our view, there needs to be a proper ind independent appeal to a third party. Um, and, and furthermore, the borrower needs to have the tools at their disposal to make out the arguments as to why, for example, they think their mortgage is sustainable or may be sustainable in, in the long run. And, you know, we have called for this since 2010. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears, we think, is a very one-sided equation, to be honest. It, it looks good in theory. You know, there's a series of criteria through which an assessment has to be made. You're supposed to look at the current indebtedness of the borrower, um, current income, payment record in the past, future access, and so on. Uh, it, it talks a good show, but unfortunately, when push comes to shove, um, it, it's an imbalanced 
instrument and the fact that you cannot use um, alleged failures to comply with the code in a repossession case in the court caps it off from the borrower's point of view. So, you know, I don't think it would be a dramatic step to allow for an independent appeal. Yeah. Well, it's a good idea. I think it's something we should definitely look at. Thanks. Mr. Joyce, I just want to ask you one question, Ms. Epp. You, you ref on, in terms of the buy-to-lets, you, you mentioned at the end of 2016 there were nearly 6,000 of them in the hands of receivers, so they had, they had gone beyond being in difficulty. The banks had taken action, appointed receivers. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned that the future occupation of tenants in these dwellings is unsecure. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense... Uh, from dealing with constituents, isn't that it's insecure? In virtually nearly all the cases we're seeing, the tenants are served notice to quit and the properties are vacant and sold um, in that manner. Um, is that what you're finding? Well, I, no, I think in some instances tenants remain, um, but the, what's happening is that the rent is being diverted uh, from being paid to the landlord stroke borrower um, to the, the lender who lent under the, the, the buy-to-let mortgage to the landlord in the first place. So the tenants can remain in situ. But, but in practice, what I'm finding is that they're not remaining. The yeah. properties are being detenanted and they're being sold vacant. Yeah. And, and my concern, I suppose, is, and I, I, I suppose I want you to reflect from what you're seeing. My concern is, at a time of a housing shortage and crisis, and use whatever word you want, you're taking a substantial number of units out of occupation mm. because by the time the bank go through the whole process a property could, be, could comfortably be vacant for a year or more by the time the receiver is appointed, the tenants are moved on, the property is sold because it's not as straightforward, it's not as quick as mm. selling a normal property. It's an extended period um, and for many of us that's what we're seeing. Yeah. When, the, when the receiver is appointed the first thing that seems to happen is the tenants go. Yeah, well that happens in a number of instances, but it appears from the central bank figures that there are 6,000 rent receiver cases in place. Now, the receiver is presumably appointed in, in order to take control of the rent. It assumes that if there's a rent receiver, there's a rent being paid. It's obviously, of course, also the case that some, uh, some properties are being vacated in order to be sold. Um, a lot of those properties, though, will still be in negative equity. Uh, and in fact, that's also one of the reasons, perhaps, why, why there's a number of possessions order, orders out there that haven't been executed. Um, but they, they appear to be the figures, I mean, just short of 6,000 rent receivers, but 1,500 properties repossessed um, that are buy-to-let mortgages in the last three years. Okay. Deputy Coppinger? Um, yeah, just a few questions. Uh, I was uh, interested in your suggestion that we need legislation to make the code of conduct basically obligatory rather than voluntary um, in relation to uh, mortgage distress on lenders. And uh, we had a session here at the committee about legislation that we felt was necessary uh, to deal with the housing crisis and I think that that should definitely be added into the mix. Um, some of the others would be interested to hear your comments. I, I assume you're working as lawyers or in the whole legal sphere. Um, that we, we had a discussion around was obviously rent controls, and I don't know if you have an opinion about, um, about that, but there has been a debate whereby uh, it was suggested by the Minister that there was a constitutional imp impediment. Um, whereas we had speakers who came in here uh, who said that it wasn't. So. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your view. Um, the, the other one that I think is vital is this whole issue now of the biggest increase in homelessness, certainly that I see, is because of people being asked to leave because the landlord wants to sell the property, in inverted commas. Um, in some cases they are selling and in other cases they're just getting rid of the tenant, particularly if they're on rent allowance, so they can increase the rent. And there's loads of evidence of that. Um, so. I would be interested to hear your comments about uh, about that. Would you agree, for example, there should be a ban on evictions now, um, given that we have a housing emergency that you know the government could put a, for a year or whatever until the housing crisis uh, eases, until houses are built or become available. But um, 
Just in relation to your mortgage write-down uh, suggestion, again, I'm really glad that you're raising that because what we tend to hear articulated more is split mortgages and stretched out mortgages, you know. And the difficulty with that is that uh, a third of those still never are in problems um, from the, my reading. Um, and also, the point is that these people shouldn't have had this debt in the first place. It was not sustainable and they were over, you know, sold overpriced housing. Um, on the, the automatic... Yeah, another issue I want to ask you about was, it was said by another speaker who came in, which might surprise a lot of people, but that somebody losing their home that they might have paid for for 20 years or whatever doesn't have an automatic entitlement to free legal aid. And we've all seen people showing up in the courts with no legal team whatsoever and completely ignorant of their rights. In some cases, you know, I've seen a couple in my own area who are pensioners lived in a house for, uh, I think, 12 to 15 years renting, showed up in their dressing gown. You, you might remember that, that case in the High Court. But all through that, they never had any advice whatsoever. I mean, that's shocking that this is happening to people now. Um, and yet we see, obviously, very wealthy people in and out of the courts every day. Um, so would you agree that that should become automatic, that somebody faced with losing probably the biggest thing in, in their life? And can I just ask about what you think about awareness about tenants' rights? What I find shocking is the people that I deal with seem to have no conception of the very... We all agree, I think, tenants have very limited rights in this country compared to other countries. But even I've been... When you get into it, there is actually things people can do, but they're completely oblivious to it. And I'm just wondering why there isn't education campaigns, awareness campaigns, through the length and breadth of the country, telling people... Considering where people, people being made homeless every day, that what you can do if you're told to leave the property, what does overholding mean, what does rent, you know, all of these things should be becoming much more known by people. And uh, people shouldn't have to come to a TD to be told that. You know, and they, they should, it should be automatically, and people don't necessarily have the, the means to access that information easily either. Um, so, yeah, I just wondered what you would think of that because uh, it just seems so surprising. People, every single day, leave properties. Um, sometimes they could have done more to stay in them, but we all know if people leave a house now, they're on the homeless list. There is nothing else for them, particularly if they're on rent allowance, and even if they're not, if they don't have a, a strong income. So um, had you approached the government about anything like that or... I'm sure you'd be willing to give your services to an advertising campaign. Thank you, Deputy Coppinger. Mr Joyce. OK, that's a large enough uh, agenda, but uh, starting at the back, um, just in terms of awareness, I mean, there is a lot of information available. Uh, FLAC, for example, has, has a leaflet on tenants' rights. Threshold, um, which we would view as the primary agency uh, in the state providing information on, on landlord and tenant law and so on, has, has a lot of information available and services. I think part of the, pro the problem here as well, though, um, which we would have seen over the years, is that people in difficult situations, over indebtedness, rent arrears, and so on, um, you know, are not necessarily uh, feeling normally about their lives. That's a very bad way of putting it. But we have done research in the past, um, interviewing indebted people when they got out of their problems and the other side of the problem. And they said they, they just temporarily didn't really understand what was going on, found things very confusing, were, were very stressed and so on. And I think that would be a very important thing to accept is that over indebtedness, uh, been in financial difficulty is very disabling for people. Um, and, you know, in relation to this scheme about to be rolled out by the Legal Aid Board and MABS, Department of Justice, Social Protection, there's a number of agencies involved, the critical thing is to publicise it properly um, through the proper media. People, you know, it, and, and a leadership has to be taken here. The state has to promote this and explain why this has been introduced. What is the problem and why are we trying to resolve it this way and take leadership and, and ownership of it? Um, the legal aid side of this, um, you know, the Legal Aid Board um, has law centres all over the country, um, does an excellent job, 
but primarily in the family law area, where, where there is still huge demand. Um, so it's understandable why they would prioritise family law, but the Civil Legal Aid Act only excludes certain areas of law. Debt isn't one of them. Uh, rights or interests over land is an excluded area under the Civil Legal Aid legislation, and that needs to be uh, amended. The board is doing the best it can, I think, with the resources it has. It just doesn't have the resources to cover a wide number of areas of law. And again, this is something that free legal advice centres would have been campaigning for uh, for, for a long time. Um, just on the mortgage write-down issue, I mean, there is under section 102 and 103, and there's various different subsections of the Personal Insolvency Act, a suggestion that a personal insolvency arrangement application, okay, been made by an insolvency practitioner, might propose the write down of an existing secured debt to something approaching its current market value. Okay, so let's say you owe 300,000 euro, but the house is worth 200. That the PIA proposal would incorporate that write down uh, as a proposal. And there is even a right within that section, if the PIA is accepted, for the creditor to claw back the difference if the property is sold for a greater amount down the road. That's actually in the design of the personal insolvency legislation. I checked with the Insolvency Service of Ireland this week, and they don't have a category for PIAs with the write down uh, feature because they don't appear to be happening. And I think you're quite uh, correct, Deputy Coppinger, that, that the split mortgage has been promoted as, uh, as, as a, a kind of implicit write down. But a split mortgage involves servicing one part, warehousing another, and the warehouse is going to become due someday. And nobody is exactly sure how it's going to be treated at that point. Now, it's been suggested by some credit institutions that there will be a right for the borrowers to remain in the property for the rest of their, their remaining lifetime. But there's still a capital balance to be paid, and any of the split mortgages I've seen don't propose to write that down. So... There is evidence of split mortgages already, 5%, uh, and uh, the, the figures are there. The number of split mortgages, it's, it's well up beyond 25,000, and there's been over 20,000 of them in the last three years. 5% of them are already failing. A quarter of the capitalization of arrears restructures are, are now back in arrears again. So we think there's evidence of, of what looks like a restructure that is actually... Um, likely to cause difficulty down the road. Um, now, where the landlord wants to sell, um, again, it's not an area where we would have particular expertise in the housing landlord and tenant uh, area, but I understand under the residential tenancies um, legislation that, that a landlord, if uh, proposing to evict someone with between six years and four years in the tenancy um, may evict on the basis um, that the property is to be sold within three months. Um, so the property would have to be sold within three months, first of all, but I see no reason why um, a temporary amendment at least couldn't be introduced to put a moratorium in place uh, on the amount of notice that might be required in a particular housing emergency. Which, which brings you to the back to the first question, which is constitutional issues. And I know that you've heard from um, a number of speakers about, about you know, what is constitutional, what's unconstitutional. Um, there's a bill this evening, it looks like, that will we'll look at imposing some kind of... Um, uh, uh, imperative on lenders not to increase variable rate mortgages and so on. Is that unconstitutional or not? I think Edmund Holmahan, when he was before um, this committee, summed it up fairly well, that it's a question of competing interests. And, and all personal rights in the Constitution, as I understand it, are, are subject to regulation in the public interest. There's only one way of finding out if something is unconstitutional, and that's in the Supreme Court or High Court. And, you know, we have had a personal debt crisis now going back to 2008, but, but not that many really daring pieces of legislation. If, if something is unconstitutional or potentially unconstitutional, it can be referred to the Supreme Court before it's enacted. 
um, and the Supreme Court can adjudicate upon it. But you have to create the bill in the first place, um, and that hasn't happened in a number of instances. And whether it's compulsory purchase orders or compulsory write-down or imposing a moratorium on how houses can be repossessed and tenants evicted, it's the same constitutional question, it seems. As you've raised that point specifically, the right to, to housing, uh, and you mentioned it in, in your opening statement, whether it should be a matter of law or constitutional change, what's your preference and why? Um, well, I know that, I mean, again, the, the experts in this area or the people who've done the work in this area really recently are Mercy Law Resource. Um, their view and the view of the Constitutional Convention is that there should be a right to housing enshrined in, into the Constitution. Obviously, it would take time to do that um, in terms of, you know, a bill would have to be put together and, and a referendum take place and so on. As an immediate priority, a right to housing can be put uh, on a legislative basis. Uh, I think what Mercy Law were saying is, is that legislation can be amended, uh, the intention of legislation could be reversed. If something is in the Constitution, um, then it would require a further referendum to reverse it. So the constitutional route is obviously um, a firmer grounds. Um, both, I think. Yeah, here. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, just, come, just to come in there on that as well, I think irrespective of the, the approach which is taken, I think having a right to housing would definitely be important just because of the fact that if there was a right to housing which, which could be enforced, it would definitely guide and strengthen um, decision making and the development of law, laws, policies and practices. Um, I definitely think if government decisions and expenditures w w was geared towards the goal of the right to housing and fulfilling the right to housing, whether that's in the constitution or in, in domestic law and legislation, um, I think that it, it, it would just be a benefit just to have that there and to have a legal remedy there for people to be able to uh, enforce and vindicate. Um, as you know, we're, we're an organisation which promotes access to justice and it's very difficult for people to, to argue uh, sometimes when there, when there isn't actually a right that they can actually rely on um, specifically. So. Um, Either or, but both would, both would be great. Thank you very much. Anybody else, colleagues? I just have okay. question. I might be asked, I'm not too sure. Um, I, I did read uh, your presentation earlier. Um, Mr Joyce, just, just when people come to FLAC for, to get advice or legal advice, how long does it take actually before people actually get the opportunity, maybe even go into court? Is there a length of time that that takes? Well, again, as I would have previously said, I mean, we're, we're a voluntary organisation, yeah. so anybody can access our service. There isn't a means test. There, generally speaking, is, isn't uh, any kind of waiting list. But the, the person in the centre is a volunteer lawyer who's at work during the day. Um, so we'll give the person a steer on their legal query. Often it's a signposting service more than anything else. Um, and then... Often an application for legal aid from the Legal Aid Board may need to be made at that stage, if, particularly if it's a family law matter. Um, in some instances, the suggestion from the volunteer lawyer will be to engage a solicitor or go to another organisation. It, it really depends. Um, but the most important thing to say is that those centres are not, they don't involve taking on clients or legal representation. And, and you know, FLAC does do a small amount of casework, but generally speaking, with a public interest litigation focus to it. So, you know, FLAC will take cases, but usually um, in order to benefit, a, what potentially benefit a wider uh, range of people rather than as a service provision. Thanks. Deputy Thank O'Sullivan. I just have one question, and to acknowledge, first of all, your very focused recommendations, which, was, which is what people are being asked to do. Um, and it's in relation to FLAC generally, what percentage of the work that you do would involve housing issues? Because I know the wide range of work that you're involved in. So where does housing come on the, 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 the bigger scale of things? Thank you, Deputy. And Mr. Joyce, and you're answering it just for, for all of us. You, you might give us an idea how many centres there are and maybe the, the number of clients you might see over the course of a year, to put it in some perspective for us. Okay, um, I wouldn't have those. Uh, do you have those figures there, Kieran? Yeah. yeah, well, I just have um, 
the figures in relation to, so we operate both a telephone information line and an, an, a, a, the advice centres as well. Um, in relation to, to housing, 14.3% uh, of all of our calls were, were housing related in 2014 now. Um, and then in the advice, uh, in the flat clinic, sorry, um, housing was 6.4% um, of, of all calls. So that was we, we do have a telephone information and referral line as well as the centres. So in our, we have one office in Dublin, um, but that office uh, has a number of people ready to answer phone calls. Um, again, we don't provide legal advice over the phone, but legal information to, to improve people's um, knowledge of their particular position, and that's often followed by a referral to a centre or a referral to some other agency or, or, or third party. Uh, Deputy so I might just add one thing. Well, um, FLAC has a public interest law alliance project, I and mean, in that we've been um, part of a group that has brought a collective complaint before the European Social Charter. Um, so that was lodged in July 2014, and really the purpose of that collective complaint was focusing on the rights of local authority tenants. We were looking at the adequacy of the accommodation um, and also the legal remedies available to local authority tenants. Uh, something that Deputy Coppinger brought up was around awareness raising and around access to legal aid. The complaint that has been submitted, and it has been declared admissible, and the government has come back with responses on this, and we're expecting um, a, d a decision by the end of the year. And really it's looking at legal remedies, the fact that if you're a local authority tenant, you don't have access to a tribunal like the way you would have with the private residential tenancy board, you don't have any access to legal representation. If you have a dispute um, in that you're potentially being evicted from your home, you have to go through a circuit court process without any access to a lawyer. Um, in addition to that, we've noticed um, with our partners who've been involved in this collective complaint is that there are serious issues around the adequacy and the standards, um, and that's why really there has been a lot of um, submissions in around you know, the, the standard of health of the family, of the children, and also social exclusion and poverty, because while Ireland ratified the Charter 16 years ago, we didn't ratify the optional protocol, uh, which meant that, um, sorry, we didn't ratify the Article 31 on housing, so that wasn't able to be argued. And additionally, we did not uh, ratify the optional protocol, which means that um, NGOs or individuals within Ireland can't um, argue um, or make a, com make a complex collective complaint, what we can do is we can do it through an international body um, and that's what FLAC has done with our um, membership with the FIDH which is an international human rights body so I think kind of we are hopeful that by the end of the year we'll have an outcome from that those findings will also you know, will be put towards the government and you know, at that point they will have to respond um, I think it's quite topical because even yesterday there was um, obviously the decision around um, traveller accommodation and there has been some serious findings in that regard Deputy Byrne, did you want to? Just, just can I just ask if, if uh, we got them before? We got a little pamphlet for the offices from FLAC. So, if, if any, could it be possible if we could get some more of them because we're very useful for giving to people when they came into clinics and things like that? That, that landlord and tenant pamphlet has been updated to reflect okay. changes in the residential right. tenancies legislation, and I think it's the, the new version will be available very shortly. Right. Yeah. There are other pamphlets Why and leaflets on lots yeah. of other areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah. grand. Thanks. Thank you very much. That uh, concludes this afternoon's meeting. I'd like to thank uh, the, the members of FACT for attending here today. Uh, Ethna Lynch, Paul Joyce, Kieran Finlay, thank you very much. And not just for answering the questions, but more, more specifically for the document you sent. And in particular, you adhered to, the, to our request and had some specific recommendations because like, we're always discussing the issue, but we're trying to look for possible solutions to improve where we are. And in particular, I suppose, it has been raised a number of times today and it certainly resonates with the members, uh, the, the issue giving statutory recognition to the issue around the code of conduct and so forth. Uh, you, you've said it today, but it has been said at other times and it has been said forcefully. So thank you for your appearance today. Uh, we now adjourn till Thursday morning at 10.30. Thank you.